Good afternoon and welcome to the 16th Regulators and Policymakers Retreat being organized by API here at Goa. With me is Mr. Ishmael Blackgrove, who is a speaker at Speaker's Corner. Yes. And you're also a social justice campaigner. Yes, also a filmmaker, writer. Yeah. You've seen it and done it all in Ishmael, right? I've seen quite a bit. Seen, seen a fair bit of the world and what goes on. Okay. So tell me, Ishmael, uh, what has been your experience at the Regulators and Policymakers Retreat thus far? It's been a fantastic um, meeting over the last couple of days. I've met some very, very interesting people, people, in, um, the regulators, the policy makers, people involved in industry. Um, but what sort of struck me most was really, I think, the commitment by those involved to really sort of make, ch to make change and lasting change. Uh, as a social justice campaigner, I felt that was my input. My, my input really was to, um, to keep the meeting um, focused in, in in one sense, uh, upon the people, and, and always making sure that people recognise that the base of the society and the people, the masses, um, are really where any sort of change should be focused. Drawing on your experience as a documentary filmmaker uh, and also as a social justice campaigner, what do you think the idea of justice or social justice really is across all the places that you visited and the people you have talked to? I think, irrespective of where I've been and where I've worked, I've worked across Africa, I've worked in Asia, I've worked in Latin America, I think um, people, there, there is a, there's a, a common connection in terms of the, the human, human aspirations. People want to sort of have a, a decent salary, a decent sort of working conditions, um, protection of the environment, spaces where they live, a sense of ownership, I think, um, and I think that is the sort of dialogue that needs to take place between service providers, those who are sort of providing energy and power, and, and uh, uh, especially in the areas which are going to be most affected. Uh, when it comes to providing or setting up energy production facilities, there's this usual concept that says, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Mm. Yeah? So I want the cheap power and I want the convenience of the electricity, but I don't want to have it set up in my backyard. At least the generation should not be set up. So how do we, uh, you know, how do we work out these contradictions? It's very, very difficult, and I certainly don't have the answers for that. It really depends upon the communities in which you're working, um, the demographics, the, 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 the challenges that, are, that, that each community faces. You know, there are, it's, it, it's too complex to sort of give a sort of one-size-fits-all response here, but I do think it's important that dialogue is open, that sort of uh, power producers start conversations and communications with communities to fight to, and also to, to reassure them um, that they're not going to be disenfranchised and marginalised from their own lands. Um, I think it's important that, that, that these conversations are ongoing, um, but it's not an easy process. I was just speaking to someone just a short while ago who virtually asked me the same question. He was an energy producer from uh, Delhi, and he was asking about this very same challenge and talking about them wanting to invest in a certain areas. However, they were sort of what was perceived as extremist activists who were opposing everything that they were doing. And he was asking my advice as to how to go about that. And one of the things I suggested really was to sort of set up a, a, a consult, cons consultancy on the ground, finding out what the issues are of those, those communities, what they need, and how to sort of, how that can then sort of interface with the, aspir with the aspirations of the community and what the uh, power company, company wishes to produce. So if it's about aspirations, um we see in Britain, you know, there was an aspiration among the Scots that maybe they should consider breaking away and they went to poll for that. Uh, so what is it that is uh, getting this, uh, you know, fissipariousness or this divisiveness uh, in Britain after Everybody all these years? Uh, what is it that is getting this, uh, you know, this fissipariousness, I mean, this divisive tendency, okay, let's break away because we can do better if we are a nation by ourselves. You know, how is this, what is the genesis of this thought and where is it taking Britain right now? Well, I mean, in terms of what's happening in Britain and, and, and Scotland, I live, in, I live in England. I think you know, those, again, are different complex issues. We deal with nationalism. I think people have shifted away uh, from the mainstream political parties in Britain, mainly because of their, 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 their agendas. And, and I do feel that people feel that communities, especially up north, uh, feel that they're marginalised, that they are not really receiving the benefits of central government. And so therefore, they feel that they can actually do better alone. And um, by going it alone, they think they'll have um, a better chance of... Um, of benefiting, if you like. And uh, why doesn't Britain want to be part of the EU? I wouldn't know. You'd have to ask that. You'd have to, you'd, I mean, it, it's such a contentious issue with um, different camps. It's certainly polarised um, m m m many sort of politicians within the UK, um, but it's certainly something that they, that they would necessarily need to, need to address. 
how does Europe look at the crisis in Greece and you know other economies like Portugal and Spain uh, that are having you know going through difficult times? How do they want to get out of this mess together and have uh, the European Union intact? Well, I think that's a very challenging, a very another very cha very challenging sort of question. It's a very very difficult one, especially for especially for Greece in, in particular. Um, it's an issue that I think. It, there, is, there are no easy answers, no easy solutions. Um, as regards to what Cyprus has done, uh, he's led, you know, if you look at the sort of early part of the year whereby the pe people believe that he was going to sort of um, refuse the sort of bailout, um, the, the EU bailout, and then accepted it in the, in, 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 in the final turn, I think that has sort of led to many people feeling deceived. Um, but there, 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 is a, there, are, there are a lot of crises. There's a, it's not just the economic crisis that's, that, that's really affected in Britain. You can see the sort of migrate, the, the issue of sort of migrants and um, uh, what's going on in terms of Syria and Libya and these sort of places. And I think, to a large extent, a lot of those sort of situations have been created by Western governments, by in, t in terms of the sponsoring and support of um, radical groups to overthrow Assad and what took place in Libya. So I think there are very complex sort of issues that are moving around in Europe at the moment. Right. Seeing so as we've sort of gone on this curveball into Europe. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So earlier it used to be that uh, Europe and America would militarily intervene where they would see that, you know, there is a dictator and he is committing atrocities and he's like really crossed the line, you know. He could launch nuclear weapons and that sort of thing. What does Europe want to do now? Uh, um, these are very, very weird questions, uh, but this is what Europe wants to do now, and especially how you sort of frame the question in terms of wanting to overthrow dictators. I think Europe and Western governments have their own geopolitical interests of which they then sort of impose upon uh, other regions of the world to sort of simply to say that there are dictators. You know, there are dictators in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain. I mean, there is no real democracy in in, in, in in Middle East. Yet there are governments of which are friendly with the with with Western with, with Western governments, and governments are not friendly. I think there's something very criminal and illegal about what has taken place. I mean, if we look at what's been going on in Libya, for example, and the overthrow of, of, of Gaddafi, the destabilization of that country, the financing, support, arming, and training of radical um, groups who are aligned um, to terrorist groups. And we've then seen that with repercussions into Syria. We've then seen the rise of ISIS. Um, I think a lot of that um, is a result of Western support and arming and training of these radical um, sort of groups. So I think it's a bit disingenuous and dis dishonest to some extent to then just later on reflect back on the issue of terrorism right. and these sort of issues that now sort of flick the, the world. Finally, do you think there is space for uh, civilians or civil society or civil bodies to cooperate across the globe, you know, given that social media and the internet is there, in, manner that, uh, in a manner that we can influence each other, know from each other's best practices and ensure that, uh, you know, these things don't happen, we have a more prosperous and a more s safer world? Um, I'm not sure in terms of whether it would be a safer world or a more prosperous world, but I do know that communication is, that is happening. Uh, social media has connected the world. People are communicating. There is through Facebook, Twitter, and all these other sort of um, means of um, social communication through technology. That is, hap that is happening. Uh, people are learning about um, different um, campaigns, issues that are being raised through social media. For example, the Black Lives Matter in the U.S., um, it means that people around the world, where, no matter where we are, whether we're in India, the UK or Brazil, we can actually connect up to what is taking place on the ground, see instant images um, of what's happening, to communicate with the organisers and to hear the polarity and sort of experiences and um, opinions that exist um, in that ongoing space. So it, it means that protest in some way has also become globalised. As a campaigner, um, I don't necessarily need to travel to West Papua to communicate with those who are organizing the dispute or, uh, or organizing um, resistance um, in that part of the world. I communicate with them online, we can gather support, we can know exactly what our support base is. Um, you know, so yes, so new technology has narrowed the world. Um, the internet has become the modern AK-47. Um, and I think there are, there are serious means with which to change, influence those in power. Um, but as the same t at the same time that the people are becoming empowered, so too are the global elite becoming empowered. And so it means there's still yet a, a major face-off 
to be had. And I don't think it necessarily needs to be that way. I do feel through conferences like this that those regulators, policymakers, people who are in key positions uh, to make decisions can actually interact and engage with social justice activists and campaigners who will represent or speak up on the behalf uh, of the people on the ground. Because you brought that up, do you believe that the gap between the haves and the have-nots you know, or between the big fat cats on the top, as they say, Main Street and Wall Street, yeah. Can that be bridged? Can we see greater equality or are we going to see greater inequality? I think that really depends upon the conscience of those who have um, and how much do they need to have. Um, the haves continue to want to have and that can sort of um, create problems. How much is enough? Um, I think with a, a sharing of power, sharing of resources, sharing of wealth, I think all of that would sort of really mitigate the sort of challenges that are in front of um, the two different two factors, if you like, and we put it when you put it that way, with the shades of grey in between. I, I think that the unbridled capitalism is very dangerous, and I think that's what we've certainly been seeing over the last fifteen or twenty years, um, as it's matured, and in its maturity, we've seen the sort of banking crisis, the global economic collapse. Um, the disinterest um, and the apathy towards those who don't have. We, in Europe, we've, what we're witnessing is almost akin to fascism, whereby we're seeing hundreds of people drowning and as a result of escaping, is trying to escape war um, without any real concern uh, from European governments, almost akin to what was taking place uh, with Jews trying to escape the Nazis during the Second World War. We're witnessing hundreds of people dying daily um, without any c care or consideration for these people. Um, and so I think that's very, that's, that's very, very dangerous. On that note, Ishmael, thank you so much. Thank you. And we hope you enjoy the retreat. Thank you very much.